I cannot know, um, nor should I know probably, nor should I even try to imagine what the next 50 years of theater in Los Angeles is going to be. Um, to do so, I think, is, is utopian. But I think what we can do is to suggest a method to tear down what I see, at least, as a broken, uh, even criminal model which is corporate nonprofit theater in this country. The people that I think have killed theater for 40 years. Uh, represented in Los Angeles, since we're talking about Los Angeles, by the Center Theater Group, which is the great mausoleum on the hill down the Palmer. Now, to, to really understand why why this model is broken and the ways in which it is broken it requires that <coughs> we, we put some kind of, provide some kind of context for how this, this system evolved. So if you will bear with me, I am going to, in a very schematic and reductive way, uh, trace the evolution of forces that, that brought us to where we are today. Uh, if we go back to the 18th century, very briefly, uh, we, we see the beginning of the publishing business. And, and that was really the first split between you know, high art, in quotation marks, and, and commercial art. And writers were suddenly loosened from their dependence on, on patronage the church or royalty or something. Uh, and, and they formed a new reliance on market demands. Uh, you know, if we had time, we would talk about the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, Baudelaire, and all kinds of things. But, but if we fast forward from that to the, the, the rise of modernism, in the 20th century, say 1910, uh, the, the, the engine that drove modernism was essentially the avant-garde. And there were several avant-gardes. But what is germane in this is that the avant-garde was intimately connected to a political critique of, of bourgeois society, bourgeois conformism. And uh, already by 1910, artists were resisting what they saw as an increasing domination of culture by an institutional authority. Uh, Post-World War I, and more profoundly, post-World War II, the avant-garde began accommodating itself to this institutional authority, and there's a whole lot of reasons for that. Um, but if we look at the situation after World War II, we see the rise of technology, technological mass culture, what Adorno and Horkheimer came to label the culture industry. And this was the rise of, of a sort of kitsch aesthetic in, uh, in Western culture. And one definition of, of, of kitsch culture would be a homogenization of difference. So the, the, you know, and I'm being very simplistic because there were several branches of several movements after World War II, but the rise of marketing and a corporate model for institutional authority uh, became ever more entrenched in American society. And uh, the cultural industry actually was later described in the 60s as the society of the spectacle about the situations. But, but this, this accommodation to conformism and, and, and institutional authority and so forth, uh, began to, to somehow merge and meld with 
marketing, advertising, and all institutions, both academic and, and you know, corporate. And uh, Leo Lowenthal, who was one of, the, one of the Frankfurt thinkers, described the culture industry as psychoanalysis in reverse. So in other words, they were producing product that was meant to put people to sleep. And, um, you know, and they largely succeeded. Now, this was, if we want to think in Marx's terms, a, a, a switch from use value to exchange value. And uh, it's what Horkheimer also described as instrumental reason. You know, we could, we could uh, digress here in all kinds of ways, but I'm, I'm trying to trace a through line that is about a commodification of, of cultural product. And since we're here speaking of theater, it was the commodification of, of theater. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that I think theater inherently resists commodification. So on one level, the broken model we see today uh, is partly broken because it's an unsuccessful commodification of cultural product. So this also resulted in a textual domination by these institutions, which in a sense is a robbing of meaning from the words, but also from the images. Uh, critics, academics, all in a sense aided and abetted this. I mean, critics became consumer advocates in a sense. So from the 50s onward, the private interests of a corporate capitalist class dictated all institutional public authority. And it resulted in, among other things, the imposition of industrial time and space on human perception. So that schools look like factories or prisons. And if we look at the Amundsen complex downtown, um, you know, we see a space that, that probably resembles a factory more than anything else. Uh, it, it's a space robbed of, of spirit and blood and life. And they are essentially in the business of recycling the familiar. Now, it's interesting that writers after World War II, playwrights, uh, began having their plays developed. Uh, develop under the guidance of the institution, under the authority of the institution. So, you know, we have an entire culture in a sense that is, you know, if, if it, it's like there is, a, it's like mental factory farming. Uh, you know, we have. One fourth of, I think, Americans have been on antidepressants, endless numbers of children are heavily medicated, and so forth. And there was a recent study that came out that minority children, black and Hispanic children, spend twice as much time each week in front of the television, 42 hours, in fact, which is twice as much as affluent white children. So it's a, it's a kind of warehousing. It's chemical warehousing, it's psychological warehousing. Um, the prisons are, are physical warehousing. So this, this compulsive repetition of kitsch and political disinformation is the corporate nonprofit model. And it's what, to my mind, you know, in this city is represented by the paper. Um, so, you know, theater, has the potential to be transformative. Art has the power to be transformative. Uh, but the, the radical voices that once were the engine for avant-garde movements, the front edge thrust of culture, have been essentially marginalized. 